right, so good morning, good afternoon, everybody. We've got an audience joining us from across North America and beyond, and welcome to another exciting session of Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. I know we've got a lot of familiar faces today, but if you are new to our organization, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world with like a gazillion free live programs. We love to bring these amazing speakers and stories to you every single day, and so thank you so much for continuing to join us on our journey. Now for today, we are blessed to have a really amazing speaker on a really amazing topic. I must admit, I love everything that we do. I love deep space. I love dinosaurs. It's all super cool. But the deep sea has always held a special place in my heart. And today, we are joined by the Monterey Bay Research uh, Aquarium Research Institute, one of the iconic research and education places on this entire planet, to talk with Shannon Johnson. And she is a senior research technician, which means she gets to go into submersibles. She gets to play with some cool robots. She gets to learn more about all all the amazing creatures that live in the deep sea and she names them after rock stars which i think is super cool so i'm excited to dive in with shannon i hope you guys are too and without further ado shannon thank you so much for joining us today and take us away <laughs> hi everybody thank you so much for coming to my living room <laughs> um so with that being said i really want you guys to like join in the conversation ask me questions because i feel like i'm sitting here talking to myself and you guys are probably much better at Zoom and all this sort of online learning than I am. So please dive in because I have still not gotten used to it. It feels lonely and weird. We, um, promise, so, we promise to not make you feel lonely and weird. We are in your course <laughs> all day long, okay? It's going to be the best question Perfect. period of your life on a video call. Fantastic. All right. Um, okay. So, and you have to laugh at my jokes. That's the other thing. Okay. If I have them. <laughs> Um, so I'm a deep sea biologist, and I do a lot of different stuff in the deep sea, but mostly, um, well, first, like, I'll tell you guys all about Ambari. So I don't know, you guys are all over the country, which is so cool. So that is one of the good things about being online is that I can talk to you guys all over the country. Um, and I, you know, it would take me a lot longer to come see you in your classrooms than just zooming in. So that means I can go surf on my lunch break instead. So uh, we are located in Moss Landing, California, and it's okay if you've never heard of Moss Landing because it is a teeny tiny little, basically it's a harbor, and we're like about an hour and a half south of San Francisco. And the reason why Ambari, so we're the sister research institute to the Monterey Bay Aquarium, so maybe some of you guys have been there. All the local kids have been there on like dozens of field trips. Anybody out there been to the Monterey Bay Aquarium? Ooh, we can ask our classes that we've got groups in South Carolina, Ontario, we've got a lot of head shaking no and people can share in the chat too if they have any thoughts. I don't think our groups are close enough to be able to have gone. Yes, there. I, yeah, <laughs> I, I want to come one day, but not yet. Well, if you ever get the chance, come because we just opened a new deep sea exhibit. Ooh. And so some of the animals I'm going to tell you guys about today, you can see live and in person at the aquarium. So anyway, it's a big aquarium. It's located in Monterey, California. It's really cool. It's really beautiful. I totally recommend it. I'm not biased at all. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, we are sister to them. And so our job, their job is to educate people. Our job is to explore and study the deep sea. And so we're in Moss Landing and Moss Landing is the closest place on earth to the deep sea. And so that's why we're there with a harbor. Um, and this is our building. We're right on the beach, which is good for surfing. And the reason why we exist is um, many years ago, Mr. Packard, so you guys probably all see like HP computers, Hewlett Packard, everything. Well, who, HP or Hewlett Packard, Mr. Packard and Bob Hewlett um, invented kind of the personal computer in their garages in, in Palo Alto, California. And um, so they were really innovative, right? Like, Computers used to take up a whole building, one computer. Now that building sized computer, we in our phones, hopefully you guys don't have phones yet, but in your mom's phone, in her pocket, it's more powerful than these computers that took up a whole building. And that was in part thanks to Dave Packard and Bob Hewlett. And so they invented this tiny little per personal computer that we could all have in our houses and then later in our phones, right? And so they're really innovative. They're brilliant engineers. And they saw us doing things like this is a net. This is a huge, huge net. It's called a Mother Tucker trawl. And it's called the Mother Tucker because it is the biggest net that they make. And there's only one or two of these in the world. 
And so this net is made for dragging out into the open ocean to collect animals. But when you just drag a net at different depths, you don't know where the animals came from. You don't know, you know, a lot of animals see this thing coming and they're like, I'm out of here. That thing's scary. It's noisy. It's big. It's making these like crazy swirly patterns or they just totally um, like liquefy the animals. Like if you're working on a nice, delicate, sensitive jelly, they don't want to get stuck in the net. They're going to get smushed. And so we see a really weird pattern of animals. We don't see what's really out there. And Mr. Packard thought, huh, these biologists need some help. They need some innovation. And so he just, he founded Ambari, where about half of us are um, engineers and half of us are biologists. And so it's the biologist job to come up with the really hard questions. And it's the engineer's job to um, come up with a tool that can help us answer that question, like robots. Well, well, these aren't robots, these are people. Because we do humans, right? Most of the ocean and the world is in the deep sea. Very, humans can access very little of it. We can access basically just the surface. And it's a big place, right? The ocean is the biggest environment in the world. And so we have only barely scratched the surface with divers, right? Um, and boats, boats help us get into the ocean, but it all, they also um, only occupy a little tiny point in the ocean, right? And so um, these are our two boats. We have the Western Flyer and the Rachel Carson. Pretty soon, the Western Flyer is going to retire, and we're going to get a boat called the David Packard. I wonder why, right? Anybody can you guys think why we would name a boat David Packard? Mm, tough mm. one. No idea. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Um, and wait, does anybody know why we would name a boat after Rachel Carson? Ooh, how about Miss Nagel's group? What do we think? Uh, if you guys want to unmute, I can bring you in. Who's Rachel Carson? Does anybody know? We can ask them. Uh, we you know have no guesses yet. I'm just looking at the chat. Tequila is making like a face like this. Uh, um, I don't know. Wait. Rachel Carson may be a pretty famous scientist in some way or other. That's my guess. Yeah. I got a good feeling about it. No, nope. yeah, you are correct. She's a our brilliant marine scientist. Yeah, and she was kind of the founder of the environmental movement. She was kind of the first person to be kind of like, wow, maybe we shouldn't be pumping all these chemicals into our environment. Maybe that's a bad thing. So we named a boat after her because she was a very, very good scientist. Um, and to honor her memory. So we have these two big boats, but and they're awesome and lovely. Um, but the big boats don't necessarily cover that much ground. But what they do do is they help, they both hold these remotely operated vehicles. So these are robots. And so this was Mr. Packard's dream was to build these robots to be able to access the deep sea because as a human, and, and that was me in the blue water picture, which is super cool. And blue water diving is when, you know, you guys have all seen scuba divers, right? You know, scuba Steve, scuba diving is cool, but we can only go so deep. Humans get, um, we get a little crazy after we go like 100 feet deep, right? And so we know the ocean is deeper than 100 feet, right? Anybody know how deep the sea is? It's the deepest Ooh. point. And again, if you want to put this in the chat, you're asking very rapid fire questions. But if you guys have a thought, <laughs> if you want to put it in the chat, we can do that. Uh, certainly. Oh, we got our first thing in. At least five meters is our, our thought so far. Yes. Very much deeper than five meters. I like that one, Miss Nagel. Uh, I don't know. We, I, I know we're going to go exploring into the deep sea very soon, and I think we're going to find out. We are. Yes. Well, yes, that is a true answer. More than five meters is definitely. So humans can go five meters, right? But um, there's places I've been into the ocean in almost 3,000 meters of water. So that's cool, right? It's like deep, really deep. And that's way past. And that was with a robot. I had to go with a robot on that one in a robot. But these are robots where people don't go in. Um, these are called remotely operated vehicles. And, and I like it. I love this picture on the left um, of the Doc Ricketts because it's, uh, it looks like the witch from um, Wizard of Oz, which I don't even, maybe you guys haven't seen that. That's kind of an old movie. It was even old when I was little. Um, the, it looks like the house when it falls on the witch with the legs sticking out. <laughs> but those are actually the ROV pilots because they actually fly the ROVs. Um, they're fixing it. And so these things are amazing machines, but they do break at sea all the time. Um, and so we have two of them. The yellow one, the Doc Ricketts, goes down all the way to 4,000 meters. 
And the orange one, you kind of can't tell it's orange in that picture because my ice cream is in the way. Um, that one goes to about uh, 1,800 meters. Do you guys know how much a meter is compared to a foot? Pretty Most close. Americans. We've got some Americans and Canadians today. Uh, oh, okay, see. good. We got we got a bit a mix of both. Miss Sinclair's group, our, our Montana group. How how big is a, a meter compared to a foot? Do you guys know? Hmm. Oh, they like all put their arms out. That's fantastic. That's about a meter. Yes, for you guys in grade two, that's perfect. It's about a meter. Nice. Uh, good job. Good job. Okay, so these things these things go way deeper than people, and instead of putting people in them, we um, put more samples and more batteries and not batteries. These things are a snaky thing. That's the cable and that goes up to us. So we put more cameras, more power. We can pick up huge rocks with this thing. It has two arms. Um, and so instead of trying, instead of wasting resources to keep people alive, we put this robot down. It can stay down for 24 hours if we want. People don't want to stay in the bottom of the ocean for 24 hours. There's no bathroom. It's you got, there's no snacks. It's tough. <laughs> so um, the robots are actually much easier to work with. And so what we do is we sit in this lovely, warm, comfortable control room where one scientist is the boss and the scientist gets to pick what animals we want to sample. And then we have two pilots um, and the pilots, one pilot flies the ROV. And it, when I say fly, it really is a flying because it's in three dimensions, right? There's um, all the different directions you can go in the ocean. It's not just like driving a car. Um, and then one, one pilot does the sampling. And so you, in this picture on the um, right, you can see there's uh, two, two manipulators. And so um, at the end of the cruise, when we have time, uh, the pilots always have the scientists try to operate the manipulators, like pick up those pieces of wood because it's super hard. <laughs> and so they like to give us a little bit of um, empathy for them. <laughs> so we're like, no, no, not that clam. I want the other one. And so it gives us a little bit, um, gives them a little more help from us. Okay. So at Ambari, we don't just use those robots. We have all kinds of robots. And so the reason why we have all these different robots is that you know, we can go out to sea for like a week and we'll put the ROV in the water and we get to explore, but we're exploring a very tiny patch of ocean, right? And it's really hard to understand what's going on in the world just looking at one little part. It's like my boss had this uh, really great example. If you were holding, you were blindfolded, right? And you're holding on to the trunk of an elephant and you're supposed to describe this animal just holding onto the trunk. That would be weird, right? Like, you, would you come up with an elephant or what would you come up? And you didn't know what it was, right? You were blind. So you just have the trunk. It would be tricky. You would come up with maybe not what the elephant looks like, right? And so we put all these other robots into the water. Um, these are not torpedoes. In fact, written on them, um, it says not a weapon. These are called autonomous underwater vehicles. And these, these guys go swim around and take samples without scientists. And so um, have you guys ever heard of the Mars Rover? I mean, oh, I mean, some of our classes have been in programs where we literally talk with the people that are driving the Mars Rover. So I think that they're pretty on board, our, our group. Very Fantastic. <laughs> so some of the same scientists who work on the Mars rover worked on the Mars rover now work with us. So you will maybe even have like some crossover here. And so um, turns out it's harder to program these robots to fly around in the bottom of the ocean than it is to program the Mars rover. Think about that. And for one reason, salt water. <laughs> salt water is tricky to work in. It's hard to work through. It corrodes everything. It's a mess. So, um, this has some of the brains that the Mars rover has in it, um, the, the torpedo things. And what happens is these things stay out for weeks on end. And so they give us lots and lots of data. Like the Mars rover is up there for years, right? Going around collecting data. And these uh, um, robots will go around for weeks or sometimes a month and collect data for us. And then gives us a much, and then we put a bunch of them out there. We don't just put one. And this gives us a much better idea of what's happening in the ocean. All right. So on to the fun stuff. This is a hydrothermal vent. And so I've worked on, I've gotten, I've been so lucky in my career. I've gotten to work on all kinds of different environments. And this is one of my favorites. So this is from in the mouth of the Gulf of California, all the way over here in between California and Mexico, or uh, Baja California and Mexico. 
mainland. Um, so we found these vent fields and they were incredible. They're 50 meter tall vents and these are black smokers. Um, anybody know what a hydrothermal vent is besides the video I'm showing you right now? Ooh, it's a tough one. All right, we'll go to Mr. Allardyce's class. What do you guys think? If you want to unmute your mic, you can chime in with that one, grade sevens. If not, that's fine too. Underwater volcano we've got from Ms. Nagel's group. What do we that's think of exactly Mr. Allardyce's class? Anybody want to take a shot at it? <laughs> go card. An underwater volcano is one of the uh, answers we got. Yeah, we're, we're sticking with underwater and volcanoes, Shannon. <laughs> that is the perfect answer. So the, these are underwater volcanoes. They're basically thin spots in the Earth's core where liquid hot magma, and again, you guys probably haven't seen Austin Powers, <laughs> um, leaks through and, uh, I'll make this play again, and feeds these animals. So up until the 1970s, which for me isn't that long ago, you guys were definitely not born yet. And it seems like hundreds of years ago. Um, up until then, we thought all the energy in the world came from the sun and photosynthesis. Until the 1970s, um, researchers who were actually rock scientists, geologists, right, were out studying um, the Galapagos Islands and found hydrothermal vents. And they found these giant clams and these huge, beautiful tube worms. Um, these are some of the animals that they came across. And they were like, whoa, there's biology all over our geology, which is a, a, a weird science joke. Um, something's interesting here. And so, um, these animals were in like 2000 meters deep water. There was absolutely no sun, no nothing. And so they knew that they were onto something that, that this amount of life had to be supported by something other than photosynthesis. And so they took a bunch of samples and brought them to all these biologists and the biologists were like, what are these things? And they thought that they were ancient animals from when life started. And we think that this is maybe how life started um, through what we call chemosynthesis, where these animals are being supported by the minerals coming out of the bottom of the ocean. But instead of the animals eating the minerals, because that would be hard, right? Do we eat rocks? Or no no rock eating from our classes. We've got a resounding no. <laughs> okay, good. Because that might give you a stomach ache. Um, these animals instead use bacteria. And the bacteria are the ones that are eating. And they're not essentially rocks. They're just mineral compounds. They're kind of rocks. They're like things called sulfides. It smells like fart and methane also smells like fart. So a lot of this, we bring these animals up and it smells like fart, but it's okay because they're cool. And the bacteria feed the animals. And the, instead, so these animals are so cool and so weird. They actually, the worms you see there, they're as tall as you are. They can be four feet tall. Um, and they have completely lost the ability to eat. They only take up the minerals that are coming out of the vents with those big fuzzy plumes. And um, what happens is instead of their tummy, now they have a thing called a trophosome. And the trophosome is full of bacteria. And, the, and so what happens is they take up the minerals coming out of the vents and they give those to their bacteria. And then the bacteria in turn feed the worms. So they've lost, we call it their mouths, their guts and their butts. So they don't even poop anymore. Isn't that cool? No pooping. That was a joke. You guys are supposed to be laughing. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh. Ah, 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 right. Okay. So the clams kind of do something similar instead of um, a gut. They have, they actually still have their guts, but they keep their bacteria in their gills. And so all the animals that you see in this picture are reliant on the bacteria and the minerals coming out of the bottom, whether they're those little zoarcid fishes that are swimming around and grazing, or they're actually directly linked to the bacteria. So those are vent animals, and I got, I've worked on those guys for a long time. They're super cool. But sticking with the exploring by the seat of your pants, um, this is kind of how we do science. We definitely have a plan. We go to a place. We know what we're going to collect. We think what we, we know what we're going to collect. But every now and then, we come across an amazing discovery. And so we in back in 2005, again, way before you guys were born, centuries ago, um, that we were out in the South Pacific. We got to spend the entire summer on a boat in the South Pacific. And that was awesome. Um, and we were all the way down at 38 South. Have you guys ever heard of the Roaring Forties? I don't know if we've heard of Roaring Forties. Anyone wants to share? No, a bunch of head, head shaking. No, no one's no. heard of Well, the, 
the roaring 40s are one of the hardest parts of the ocean to work on because it's in the Southern Ocean. There's just no land to stop the storms and the wind, nowhere to hide. And we were at 38 South, which is just almost to the roaring 40s. And so we thought we were a little nervous that it, we were all going to be seasick the whole time and we weren't going to get any work done. And lucky for us, it was flat, calm and totally beautiful. We could have gone water skiing. But um, instead, we came across these giant crabs. And so this was kind of cool because we were down there working in the part of the world where nobody had ever been before, which is really cool. Um, and we came across this crab. Now, let, to give you an idea how big these crabs are, I mean, like a lot of deep sea invertebrates, not the fish. The fish are like this big. Most of them are little, um, except for those zoracid fishes are a little bit bigger. The invertebrates are the big things. So these crabs were like this long. They're like a foot long at least. Um, and they had these huge, giant, hairy arms. And they were holding their arms over the hydrothermal vents. And we're like, what are they doing? And then we, you see all those little fur on their arms. Turns out they were farming bacteria. And they have those amazing claws. And they would comb the bacteria off their hairy arms and eat it. In fact, this was such a cool discovery that um, the wild crats, I know you guys know what I'm talking about, made an episode about the Yeti crab. And so this is one of those things where you go out, you have a plan, and you come across something super cool, and there it is. And you get to make this amazing discovery. And this turned out to be a whole new family of crabs. We collected one specimen. That was a mistake. Um, but now they've found Yeti crabs. They're called Yeti, Yeti crabs because I guess they're fuzzy something. We, we're terrible at coming up with good common names. Um, we should just call them what they are, right? You guys can say science names. Um, so uh, there's, they found different species of these guys all over the world. I think we're up to like six or seven different species, which is super cool. So yay, when you get to stop and look and find something new, it's super cool. Okay, so another story like that is, um, a long time ago, we were out looking for these clams. Are these clams fascinating or just kind of blah? Kind of blah. They look, mm -hmm. they, I, bet they, I bet they are fascinating, but they look kind of blah. Gotta Even say. when they're alive, they just kind of like sit there. But anyway, they're interesting <laughs> genetically, <laughs> which is what I do. Um, and so we were out looking for these clams and we came across, oh, what? this isn't that much fun, is it? We came across these guys. And do these, I'm curious, does anybody think these, these are worms? Do they look anything like any other worms you've seen today? Mm, I don't know. When outside it's raining where I am, a bunch of earthworms don't look at anything like that. It's pretty freaky. <laughs> right? Well, so that's definitely a thing I've always spent some time on in my career is getting kids and people excited about worms because that's what I thought used to think about when I would think about worms are the earthworms on the sidewalk, right, when it rains. But these are really cool. These kind of looked like the... Um, the vent worms that we already worked on. So we were out looking for these clams and we came across a dead whale in 3000 meters of water. And it was covered in these worms. So the white stuff in the background of this picture that you see is bone. And so these were, we we're like, what the heck? Worms living on bone? And you can actually see they have, they look like a plant that's planted in the bone. And so we were totally baffled by this. So we collected a bone and picked a bunch of worms off of it and sequenced it, of course, because that's what we do. We do genetics. Um, and we found a couple of different species. And so this actually, this big long list and this fuzzy tree are all the different species from all over the world. And so these are bone eating worms, which is totally crazy because it's another kind of nutrition to science, right? Like um, this guy is from 30 meters deep in Sweden. Uh, this guy is from the Azores near Portugal. Uh, this guy. Okay. So these worms aren't just weird because they eat bones. And they actually also use bacteria to eat the bones. They're way, way out of the photic zone except for the one species. Um, they don't have mouths or guts or butts either. They're closely related to those big giant um, tube worms I showed you earlier. Um, but the cool thing about these worms is all the big ones you see are female. And we looked and looked for males and we knew they were female because they had eggs, right? And so um, we looked and looked and looked for males and we could not find the males. And then finally we found them. And if you look at this first picture, 
see those little white things in the water column? I don't know if you guys can see them or yeah. the little white specks. Anybody have an idea what those are? Uh, little shrimpy things, little other creatures of some kind, maybe. Close. Uh, so they look like it, right? But um, those are actually the larvae of the worm. So she got nervous. Um, and I say she because all the big ones were female. Um, she got nervous and started spawning. So when we have an invertebrate um, start having babies, we call it spawning. Um, and so she let her babies out into the water column because she's like, oh, I'm about to die. Spawn, have babies. Um, and so we looked very closely at these worms and we found the males and they live in the tubes of the females. And so every female has a harem of dwarf males. And the older the females are and the bigger the females are, the more males they have, which I think is pretty cool. It's kind of our girl power story. So all these different species all have what we call dwarf males, except for this one. This one has big males. And um, uh, mostly women have worked on this project, which is I also think is kind of cool. The one man who's worked on it is, a ta is our taxonomist. And so he named it after um, the, the male god of fertility. <laughs> so he got one. Um, and so let's see. This is my favorite Ocidax, though. So these are named Ocidax for bone eating. We're back to the big females. And does anybody here like Star Wars? I like Star Wars. I've seen uh, hands up in the grade two class. Everyone in the grade two is like Star Wars. <laughs> yes, lots of Star Wars fans, Shannon. Excellent. So does this look like anybody Anybody you recognize? <laughs> Very Jabba. Very Jabba. Yeah, so I got to name this species after Jabba the Hutt. So this is Ocidax Jabba. Here, I'll make him go come back. Um, and Ocidax Jabba is also the big females with the little males, but instead of living directly on the bones, they live in the mud next to the bones on little fragments of bone. And so they're pretty cool. We're up to like many, many different species of Ocidax. They live all over the world. They're super cool. Bone eating worms with dwarf females. I mean, dwarf, dwarf males. So that's the Ocidax story. Now I work on tinafores. Has anybody ever heard of a tinafore? No, a lot of head shaking. No, no one's heard of a tinafore. They look vaguely familiar, like some other things that some of our kids might know, but no one specifically on them. Right. So these are of uh, their own phylum. What's a phylum? Anybody know what that is? I don't know if anyone knows phylum offhand. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's okay. I think the only second grader who ever knew what phylum was was maybe my kid. <laughs> um, a phylum is like how we classify animals. Like we're in the animal kingdom and phylum, right? We're vertebrates. These guys are invertebrates and they're in their own section of animals. They're not jellyfish, like with stingers. They're, very, they're jellies, but they don't have stingers, which makes them super lovely. They're the biggest animals that use cilia for, motion, for moving around. So these little rainbowy things you guys see on them, they're called teen rows. That's why they're called tinafores. Um, and they actually, they act like little paddles so they can swim around. Um, and most of them are um, in the plankton the entire time. And so I work on the genetics of these guys now, trying to understand how different populations are connected. So what I used to do was work on the genetics of the hydrothermal vent worms and clams and try to understand how the different populations all over the world were connected for them. And, but, and that was pretty cool because those were kind of like island-like oases. Mm -hmm. Now I work on these guys. They don't have any barriers, right? They can just float and swim and cruise around all over the place. And then you can see there's lots of different shapes and sizes and they're really interesting. And one of the coolest things about them um, is they do bioluminescence. And so mm -hmm. you guys, you guys have ever heard of bioluminescence? Yeah, we got heads, heads no for that one. Yeah, lots of heads. Yeah. Oh, everyone's yeah, heard of bioluminescence. Yeah, I bet lots of you live with fireflies. So these guys also do a similar way of um, lighting themselves up, which is pretty cool when you live in the deep, dark sea. All right. So, oh, then here's one more Star Wars question for you. Does this oh. look like anything from Star Wars? Because I get to name it as a species and I kind of want to name it as something. Does this look like anything from Star Wars? I don't know. I'm like really, really familiar with Star Wars and this, uh, vaguely, I mean, does it stay... <laughs> Does it stay that shape at all times, Shannon? I don't know. 
Well, they're pretty delicate, but <laughs> I, like, I like the stretching that you're doing. But it, yeah, hey, if we call it Millennium Falcone, I think we'd all be very happy with that. That's very cool. Right. Nice. All right. Okay. That's all I have for you today. I think I probably went long. Let me stop sharing my screen somehow. You're perfect. You're great. Well, that was very exciting. Such a neat opportunity to see some amazing deep sea creatures, learn how we got down there, a bit of your backstory, Monterey Bay Aquarium. And so what I said is what we're going to do now is do a little Kahoot quiz together. See how much people are paying attention. Have a little bit of fun together. Uh, many of you have already joined our Kahoot quiz. So Shannon, again, for people joining for the first time, the faster you answer, the more points you get. And you don't win anything, but you do win Shannon and I's everlasting respect, which is worth more than anything, gold, anything else. Maybe you'll get a species named after you in like 100 years or something like that. It's very exciting. So 23 of you in so far. We're going to dive in. And Shannon, when there's a few seconds left for each of these, if you want to help us out with an answer, you can uh, sure. come in. Here we go. But let's get ready. Three, two, one for our first question. And then keep those questions in your minds. You can ask anything you want about the deep sea in a minute. So two worms. We talked about them at hydrothermal vents can get how big? Six inches? Are they really, really tiny? Are they one foot? Are they three feet? Or can they get over six feet? Can the biggest ones get over six feet? What do we think? A few of you are shy right now with answers. Half of you have answered, maybe a third. Oh, coming in. Tiny worms, right? Clearly, worms are tiny in my yard. That's what I think. Oh, <laughs> 39 of you. 40, yay. A nice mix of answers, but over six feet. So in Bari site talked about six foot six, about two meter, two worms, which is awesome. Very cool creatures. All right. Expert bees in our lead. I'm excited. I hope that the name of the winning person is like a deep sea creature, but we'll find out. Okay. Many deep sea creatures are transparent. Many more are what color? You actually saw this in some of Shannon's slides, but were you paying close attention? So blue, green, yellow, or red? And I'll give you a hint. The, the color that you vaguely see in that picture is a lie. Like, don't, don't go by what I've shown you in this picture. There's a reason for this too. 44 answers. Most of you said blue. Everybody fell for it. Red is our answer. So why is red our answer, Shannon? It's exciting. So it's called attenuation of light. And so that as you go deep into the ocean, the first color that we lose is red. And so if you're a red animal, you disappear the fastest. Yeah. So basically you don't like, I mean, Things sort of lose their pigment as they get further and further down, but there's no need to have those flashy colors like we surface dwellers do because no one can see them anyway. The only time these animals are in the light is when we're pointing our big robot lights at them. And so if you're red, you're invisible. Nothing can see you down there because red disappears. Red light doesn't filter down that far, which is really cool to think about. I love it. Cute Ant takes our lead. Okay, taking our, our third question coming up now. How much of the ocean floor has been mapped straight from NOAA, one of our, our fantastic organizations doing research in the deep sea? Is it all of it? We've all, we, we've had the high resolution maps of everything. Zero, we can't map that far, it's too deep, there's no way. Shannon can't go down that far, neither can we. 50% or about 20% of our ocean. It doesn't mean all of it's been explored, it just means how much have we actually mapped the deep sea and most of you got this right. 20% was the figure most consistent online. I've also heard like 2% of the ocean has been explored, which is in more detail. You have to go and actually have researchers that know what they're doing or robots that know what they're doing. But to map it, just like you would scan something with a laser, 20%, which is wildly low. It's crazy to think about that. All right. Silly Fox takes our lead with one more question. And then we're going to dive in with questions for Shannon. So get ready. Okay, what's a super unexpected thing that the Ambari team found on the seafloor? Straight from Shannon's awesome Twitter account. So, is it a lost pirate shipwreck? Is it a mammoth tusk? Is it a super shark 100 feet long? Megalodon lives? No, it doesn't. Or is it <laughs> deeper than Mount Everest is tall? Ooh, people are having a real hard time with this one. Two more seconds. Get those answers in. Okay, it was a mammoth tusk, which is crazy. The least picked answer so, like, where did you find this? I have to know more about this mammoth tusk because it's crazy. Okay. I, I actually was going to put this in my talk, too, about another cool thing that we found that was amazing. Um, so, in, a, like, three, right before the pandemic, actually, um, we were out and we were running from the weather. Like, we do blue water diving, too. And so, to put people in the ocean, again, we're sensitive little creatures. And we cannot dive when it's windy or rough. And so, we were out... Um, like 160 miles offshore and we went to the seamount and that and we had only ever been there one other time in the 30 years we've been working at Ambari. Um, and so it, we just we literally only went there because it was like a calm spot and um, the surrounding seafloor is like 
5,000 meters deep. So too deep for us to go. So we went to the top of the seamount. And uh, we went down and we were like cruising around, looking at the seamount, looking for bottom things, which is not what my lab normally does because tenophores only bear, only a couple of them live on the bottom. And we mostly work on tenophores now. Um, and we came across this thing and we were like, the ROV pilot was the one who was like, that's a tusk. And I was like, elephant tusk? Because after working on the whale fall stuff, right? I was like, that, maybe it's a rib bone. I don't know. But it definitely looked like a tusk because it was like perfectly shaped like a tusk. And it was covered in this manganese, uh, like black sparkly rock. And so was the rest of the bottom of the ocean. And um, we broke off a little tip of it and we took it back to the um, lab and we gave it to some paleontologists and we we're like, what is this thing? And they sorted out that it was about a hundred thousand year old tusk. And we went back and collected again. We brought a bunch of paleontologists on board this time. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. they helped us collect it and preserve it. And now it's in a museum mm -hmm. in Michigan and we're studying it and trying to understand how a mammoth tusk could um, and mammoth animal could make it all the way out there. And so it's one awesome. of the oldest mammoths ever found in California. Very, very cool. How wild is that? I love it. Yeah, um, and by the way, you, that, I think that does hold the record for the least, the smallest percentage of people getting a question right we've ever had in one of our cahoots ever. So way to go. I, I do want to highlight uh, our podium before we dive with Q&A. So if you are Fast Wildcat, Silly Fox, or Amazon Wombat, let us know who you are. But that was fantastic, guys. Uh, and let's dive in with questions. So Shannon, I promised you the most awesome Q&A of all time, and we are going to dive in and make that happen. So Ms. Nagel's class, I'm going to head to you guys virtual school first, and uh, we'll go through all our live classes and our friends online. So Ms. Nagel, come on in, take us away with the first query. Our first question is from Ruby, and she's wondering how many species have you named, and like what was the most difficult one to name, either to catch it or to come up with a name? Perfect. That is such a good question. I actually don't know how many species I've named. I have named more than 10. <laughs> um, and most of the species I've named so far have been stuck to the bottom um, from hydrothermal vents. My favorite one I've named is the one I named after Joe Strummer from The Clash. So we work on these Alvinaconca snails. Um, they live, they live right around the mouth of hydrothermal vents. So like the hottest, most acidic environment. Um, and so if you're a snail, living in acid is a bad idea because it's just going to dissolve your shell, right? And so they're also covered in spikes. So these are our very hardcore punk rock snails. And so when I was thinking about names for these species, and we, we found there's a bunch of different species that were unnamed. And so um, we had to come up with a bunch of names. And they all look the same because they live in such a high acid, hot environment that um, their shells are all are like they are barely hanging together. And so, and that's what we normally name things is based on how they look or where they're from. And so we ran out of names very quickly because they all are from the same place and they all look the same. And so we got to name them after people. And when I named them after Joe Strummer, so The Clash is an old 1970s band, punk rock band from London, England, and they're very cool. So Alvin and Conquer Strummeri lives on in infamy. I love it. By the way, for our classes, I want to note, whether you're live or on YouTube, there's maybe a few hundred people in human history who can say, I don't know how many species I've named. So, wait a minute, Shannon. Um, Mr. Allardyce's class, come on in grade sevens. If you guys want to unmute your mic, you are good to go. We'll head to our Montana crew next. Hey, Mr. Allardyce. Hey, all right. I'm not sure if we have a question, although we had a couple of eaters before. Now they're, now they're getting stage break. Ooh, stage break. Ah. You can always right. share on their behalf, or you can let me know in the chat if you have one, and I'll come to you guys in a minute, okay? I ask a question, though. It's kind of off topic, but when you're down on those diving bells, what happens if you do have to go to the bathroom? Yeah. <laughs> Another good question. So I have actually the world record um, of how many times somebody had to pee in Alvin, and it's not nice. <laughs> Um, Alvin is a really cool vehicle. It's seven foot diameter sphere and you're in there with two other people. And so if you can imagine, and, and there's a bunch of equipment in there too, that are, it's there just to keep you alive. And so, yeah, no bathroom. Um, so I hid under a blanket and you basically pee in like a cup with a funnel <laughs> and yeah, five times I had to pee five times. Well, I'll let you know if I ever get lucky enough to get that chance. And my, so my whole life is leading towards trying to get on Alvin, basically. We've had Alvin on the broadcast before, by the way. I, oh, will, beat your, I will beat your record, I guarantee you. You should see me before I move. <laughs> 
terrifying. <laughs> on this Sinclair's group, come on back in in Kalispell, Montana. If you guys have one, great twos. Hi. Hi. Um, what got you into doing this? Yeah. What led to this job, Shannon? That's such a good question. <laughs> I was really lucky. I just started um, volunteering in um, a lab when I was an undergrad. I thought I was going to be a doctor. And it turns out I did not want to go work in a hospital. And I started working in an evolutionary lab in undergrad in college. And um, my the one of the um, grad students showed me what polychaetes were, were worms, these worms were. And of course, I thought all the worms looked like earthworms, right? I didn't even know what a polychaete was. Um, and so, and we started spawning them and studying their um, different genes that they had that were similar to like humans. They were called these homeobox genes. And I really was super excited about DNA. It was so cool. It blew my mind that I could hold a little tube full of DNA. And so I started doing molecular work and studying genetics. And uh, I kind of stumbled into marine science because it turns out you can kill as many ver invertebrates as you want without a permit. <laughs> and so it's really good for studying statistics and genetics. <laughs> That's like a, a sub tagline. If you want like the sinister version of this program, you can kill as many invertebrates as you want without a permit. It's beautiful. Um, touching. I love it. Um, Shannon, great question from Chloe in Miss Dester's class. Miss Dester's group is joining us at Andover e Academy in Kansas. And Chloe wants to know, did you find the coelacanth? And can you explain what a coelacanth is? Because they're the coolest. Coelacanths are amazing. I did not find a coelacanth. We found a whale fish, though. Coelacanths are an ancient lineage of fishes that we thought were extinct, right? Um, and I think one washed up on the beach somewhere in South America. Is that right? Forget. Um, I don't work on fish very often, um, but yeah, they are the coolest. <laughs> um, but we found these whale fishes, and so we have tens of thousands of hours of ROV video. We've been studying the deep ocean for about 30 years now in Ambari, and we've only ever seen this whale fish a few times. Mm -hmm. And so we got to see one and we followed it and we collected it. And so that's my coolest fish. Very, very cool. But I do encourage our classes. If you learn nothing else uh, in your day after this program, check out coelacanths because they are amazing. All right, uh, Shannon, if you've got time for it, I can whip through another round of questions with our live groups. I know we're going a little long. Perfect. Ms. Nagel's group, come on back in and take us away. Hey, guys. Mm. Hey, okay. sorry, I had to unmute there. Um, so we have Nikita wondering, what is the most harmless type of jellyfish that has ever been discovered by you, Shannon? Well, I have not. So all the tinafores I work on are completely harmless. So um, I'm working on redescribing one species right now. Most everything that we work on it was described in the 1800s, if you can believe that. Wow. So like, it's kind of funny coming from the vent stuff because the vent stuff all got, has been described by like me. And so, <laughs> or, you know, in the last 20 or 30 years. But um, the tinafores have been around for hundreds and hundreds of years. We've known about them. They're really beautiful and people have loved to work on them. But it turns out that um, there's not a lot of features to, um, to, to describe them on. They all look a lot the same, and, but their genetics are very different. And so that's what I'm working on now. So all the tinafores are harmless. Um, yep. If you want like a proper cnidarian jellyfish, Aurelia, the moon jellies are completely harmless. You can pick them up on the beach, um, but I don't, and they're the ones, they don't really have any nematocysts that will go through your skin. Um, but don't pick up jellies off the beach. I see people do it all the time. And I'm like, oh, Good lesson. <laughs> your takeaway note classes. Uh, but moon jellies, you'll see them in aquariums quite often. So if you go to an aquarium, Monterey Bay almost certainly has them. Ripley's Aquarium in Toronto has them. You'll see moon jellies. They're actually quite easy to care for as jellyfish go. So great question, guys. All right, Miss Sinclair's class. I know you guys are heading out in a second, but if you have any other questions, grade twos before we go. Hey guys, there's one in the chat. Oh, perfect. Sorry, let me get that up for everybody. Well, welcome. And I know you guys are switching periods, uh, but our second question, oh, one in the chat. Where, oh, in the live chat. Oh, perfect. How deep were the worms by the vents? Jack wants to know. Those range from like, I'm gonna guess 2,000 to 3,000 meters deep. Wow, which is crazy deep, by the way. Like, I mean, it's like, we're talking 7,000, like 10,000 feet down, which people can't go at all. I mean, in fact, submersibles, how far can Alvin go? I'm curious. Alvin, the new, so there's a new version of Alvin. I didn't, I haven't gotten to go in that one yet. Um, I think that one could go to 6,000 meters deep. Okay. Wow. It's crazy. So really deep, deeper than I would like to go. 
Yeah. <laughs> There's been about, I, I know it was two for the longest time, then James Cameron went, and now a few other people have gone, but I still think it's under 10 people have been to the deepest point of the ocean ever, which is unbelievable. So very, very cool. All right, Mr. Allardyce, one last question. Come on in to wrap us up, and you are good to go. If you have one for us. I got, uh, it. got a question. We got a question in the back. Go ahead, Jeff. Oh, yeah. How many animals have you named? How many oh, animals have you? Oh, so, how many yeah. animals have you named? Has it all been tinafores? Has it all been what kind of things? Clams, fish, anything? I've I've named some clams, some mussels, <laughs> some worms, lots of worms. So I even have. A, this is good. I can't. It's, like, it's bad. I should write down all the ones I've actually named. But there's a. A worm, an Ocidax bone named after my son. It's called Ocidax rideri. And then I got a snail named after me. There's one called Lepidodrillus shannonae. And there's another worm named after me. Oh. It's called, I think it's Amphisama the, the shannonae. But um, lots. Um, and I did see a question in the chat um, yes. about my career path. And so... Um, like I said, I, I actually went to junior college first because I was goofing off and going to be a pro snowboarder. <laughs> I grew up in Tahoe. It's not that weird. <laughs> um, and so I, when I decided that was probably not my best lucrative career path, um, I went to junior college and realized that I was actually good at math and science and that I really liked them. And when I was in high school, I had a math teacher tell me um, that, don't worry, I went to him for help. And he said, don't worry, you're not math minded. I'll pass you. And I was like, <laughs> wrong answer, dude. <laughs> so um, it turns out I just wasn't paying attention. And I, I did like math. And you know, I just had to work a little hard, harder. Um, and so um, I kind of decided I was going to be pre-med and went to UCLA for undergrad to finish after I went to junior college. And then I really liked the worms and playing in the worms. And um, I did a quarter away, which I totally recommend you guys do when you're in college. There's all these amazing like semester abroad programs and they really can to um, let you do explore different places and see different things. And I, um, we were in Bodega Bay, California, which is like this super remote, beautiful place. And that's what made me decide I wanted to do um, more marine science. I was a biochemistry major in undergrad. And so, but I really liked biochemistry and genetics. And so I just kind of stumbled my way around and like the best advice I can offer you is just keep doing stuff you find interesting and fun and stuff you like, and you will make an amazing career of it. Fantastic. What a, a great detailed answer. I absolutely love that. And Shannon, time flies and you're having fun. So if people want to learn more about you and your work, I do encourage them to check out imbari.org. Amazing stuff there. As I said, one of the best education groups and research groups on the planet. Specifically, your page. Got the names a little reversed there, but Johnson uh, hyphen Shannon. You can check out more about all the amazing work that Shannon gets up to. And if you want to check her out on social media, one of the great handles of a scientist of all time for us is at Punk Rock Snail. So thank you for that very much. Uh, <laughs> Thank you so much for joining today. Again, we've got groups from all over the continent today. And Shannon, what we do to wrap up every broadcast, I'm going to bring in Mr. Allardyce's class, bring in Ms. Nagel to say a big thank you and farewell. So everyone is now in. Unmute your mic. Thank you so much, guys. And have a wonderful rest of the day. Bye, everyone.